So what was the second piece of evidence destroyed by the police? The second piece of evidence was a single tape of a conversation that took place in 2010 or 2011. The conversation was between myself in London UK, and a physics professor Ron Edge in the United States. I made the recording on Skype free recorder or a handheld dictaphone. Let's get my facts straight. I have a physics degree from the University of Manchester UK, of 1983. I also have a master's in maths from elsewhere. I resided in the UK from 1981 to 1983, and thereafter from 2004 to 2018. In the latter 14 years, I was having a lot of immigration problems. A good reason for these problems was not apparent, and the border agency's comments failed to provide a complete or logical explanation. There were also a number of untoward happenings during those 14 years, and hate incidents that went unexplained. I was advised by an elderly lawyer in 2011 that the Institute of Physics may be responsible for the UKBA's plan to deport me. He said I might find myself in India, and never realize that this institute had been behind my deportation. This gives us a possible link between the physics community and my socio-legal situation in the United Kingdom. You will learn a little more about the Institute of Physics if you read on about the loss of the second evidence. The narration has now switched to Professor Ron Edge, and how I first met him. Dr. Edge met me in 2001 and 2003 because I was detained by USINS at a place called Columbia Care Center. I was moved to CCC because I was complaining too much about detention conditions, but INS was not willing to release me. Columbia Care Center held both USA federal and state criminals, as well as immigration prisoners. Columbia Care Center employed medical control methods on detainees. This means detainees were forcibly injected with drugs to keep them obedient to officers' orders. The injections were painful and punitive. You felt as if you would die if you got too many. People would normally obey orders to escape being injected once again. The injections were of the psychiatric category. They were given to all immigration detainees, solely to ensure cooperation. Columbia Care Center was an American detention facility to hold American lawbreakers of the State Corrections Department and U.S. Marshals, as well as immigration detainees, such as myself. It was against the law to give these painful injections to American detainees unless they turned violent towards others. U.S. citizens, including murderers, had a legal right to consent to psychiatric treatment. They were protected from these injections. Foreign detainees could be injected to make them very obedient. INS brought foreign detainees to this place with the intention of deporting them. Foreign detainees did not have the legal right to ask what drugs they were receiving, and for what illness. Foreign detainees did not have a legal right to access their medical records. There was a patient advocacy in the town who could visit detainees at CCC. But they did not have much power to help. They told me that if I could privately hire a lawyer, my medication could be stopped. This may sound unkind, however, it is the normal procedure in American prisons. I was given behavior modification treatment to prefer females. Male staff would bring me food with an emetic added, while female staff brought in delicious food. Columbia Care Center told me that they would like me to join the human race, or leave it. CCC said upon my arrival they already had a burial plot for me. They injected me for refusing to go for smokes with the females, to join the human race, where cigarettes were provided free of charge by the facility. You would either comply with whatever they said, or those injections would make you feel worse and worse and you envisaged a painful death without intervention unless you co operated. People died regularly in large numbers at CCC. Citing a dead body was inevitable for any person who is detained at CCC for some time. The CCC staff tried to conceal the deaths of prisoners of the same sex, as detainees were very moral and caring. They would cry and scream. They would be very upset about the loss of their neighbors and friends. They would threaten the staff with hell. Owing to high security, Inmates allowed out of their same-sex units were allowed to use the elevator unsupervised. There you often caught sight of a dead body of the opposite sex. It never traveled alone. A different type of narrow-wheeled stretcher, 
not used for living people was used for the deceased. They were always going down in the elevator, to be taken out of the building. It was a chilling experience, and reminded me of my own destiny. Once, a security guard Ms. Kelly secretly slipped me phone calls and was sacked for her mercy towards me. I left voicemail for a solicitor called Blake Chisholm saying I was being tortured. He got through to me. Maybe that helped me to not use that burial plot they alleged they had reserved for me. It was through these calls sneaked in by Kelly who also provided a telephone directory, that I managed to call the University of South Carolina and ended up talked to one Peter a male secretary in the physics department. The latter said he knew one retired physics professor, Dr. Ron Edge. Who would surely meet me? Dr. Edge also had his friend. Another professor Hal French, who taught religion, at the university to visit me. Dr. Edge said his friend may know someone to stop my drugging. Unfortunately, only a solicitor could do that, which pro bono agencies for immigration detainees did not cover. But Dr. Edge became my regular visitor at CCC, and became like a father and friend to me. He gave me physics exercises to do, and scored them, while I was detained at CCC. He was not allowed to visit me he was turned back after another inmate had assaulted me violently. Prison staff do not allow detainees with dreadful injuries to be seen by visitors until the wounds start healing. Several months later, the security guard Ms. Kelly returned to CCC for a visit, and said she had been sacked over helping me, but was happy. She and one nurse Shirley had helped save me and a few other detainees from lack of phone calls, and from strange medical procedures, and had been sacked immediately. I learned of three or four staff in all the INS facilities who had been sacked for helping or campaigning for me, including a pastor. Someone I care about in Canada told me later that I told him that CCC told me that psychiatric professors were conducting an experiment on me. Perhaps the psychiatric drugs caused short-term memory loss, but have no recollection of this. The meals were labeled with people's names. I made the mistake of trying to raise a stink about seeing CCC staff pour drugs into one lady's salad. CCC injected me as punishment for this aggressive action. I suffered some memory loss, and Nicholas Hersom said later, after marrying me, that I told him that some psychiatrists at the university were experimenting on me. I have no recollection of this. I suffered short-term memory loss due to severe drugging. I was flown in and out of CCC by plane in regular passenger flights to Texas. Once El Paso did not have female staff to accompany me on the plane. They gave a cocktail of seven drugs before my flight for male staff to not need to restrain me. I was asked to swallow seven unknown pills and sit on a chair for 30 minutes when I was closely watched at CCC. This procedure makes regurgitation impossible. Some people have the unusual ability to regurgitate what they have properly swallowed. After an officer checks inside their mouth, that they really swallowed it, they visit the toilet, and spit it out. Of course if you disobeyed, there would be those punishment injections and a lot worse. You might die. I witnessed what happened to gals who were deported from CCC who did not want to go. They give a shot in the arm which makes you lose your consciousness, and wheel you out of the facility. It was amazing how I became a fully conscious zombie during and after the flight. I could feed and use the toilet without help, and understand simple instructions. But I could not run or act up. I felt helpless, both physically and mentally. My field of vision was like a tunnel with brownish darkness on the left and right. I was anxious to trot behind the officers through the long airport, as I had to strain to see them with such a narrow field of vision. Back in El Paso, all I recall was deep brown glass as a barrier, and waving to one friendly officer. He knew about my recent cocktail in South Carolina. He said later that I knew where I was and the date and time. He said I gave my date of birth and other details correctly. So my thinking was switched on after the cocktail but I don't remember his talking to me. He said he thought I was doing okay as I was so smart after the cocktail. My field of vision recovered in a day or two, but the after effects of the cocktail took around three months to wear out. I would say that was 2002. Therefore I had no difficulty believing the late Regent Exeter, 
in Shropshire, who said in 2011, who said he was inducted into psychiatry at around 19 years by a single shot to his arm, whose damaging effects lasted for six months. The hospital in London, UK promised Regent, he could have free food and accommodation in exchange for a small shot in the arm, when he was homeless. After the injection, I was not physically fit to live in any place but a hospital, he had said. What I have been discussing above, the Columbia Care Center, or CCC, an American detention facility, is one of the places where INS detained me, while waiting for my asylum claim to be processed in the United States. The CCC narration dates to the years 2001 to 2003. In fact, the 9-11 disaster took place when I was in CCC, and saw it on televised news. The CCC narration tells the reader how I met Dr. Edge, an eminent physics professor who hails from England and the University of Cambridge. I have detailed how I met Dr. Edge.